Welcome to the Fandom Podcast Network special presentation of the Hair Metal Podcast. The Hair Metal Podcast covers bands that reached several levels of popularity and notoriety during the mid to late 1980s hair metal explosion and through its eventual decline in the early 90s. We are also we also cover many bands that may or may be categorized as hair metal, but did meet, meet many levels of popularity during that hair metal rush. But we have a special uh, program for you guys here today. Uh, we lost a rock legend, and uh, I wanted to uh, get some good friends of mine to talk about this. So we're going to be having a Eddie Van Halen tribute here on the Hair Metal Podcast. My name is Kevin, and I'll be your host. I'd like to introduce my guest for this very special Hair Metal Podcast. Please welcome Murph. How are you, sir? I'm doing fantastic. Glad to be back here on the Fan of Podcast Network. I feel like it's becoming my home away from home, man. You guys are always so <laughs> gracious with the invites and uh, and and always love to talk uh, things pop culture with you guys and especially a little bit of rock and roll on a on a for, uh, a sad reason to get together, but uh, really cool to be uh, be here and uh, and talk a little Eddie Van Halen with you guys. Good to have you. Uh, also, too, my uh, fellow co-founder of the Fandom Podcast Network. Couldn't do this without Kyle. Thank you. Come on, Kyle. Oh, it's always good to be here, especially on my, this is my first appearance on hair metal. It is. It is. Yeah. 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 So, you know, finally I, I get on hair metal. I wish it was a little under a little better circumstances, but you know, it's going to be good to pay a tribute to, in my opinion, one of the top three gods of rock at this point. It's true. Mean, I've been asking you to grow your hair out and then you can finally come on hair metal, but you never got around to doing that. So this is an exception. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah this is my, I, I can't grow my hair out and I'm never going to have a Murph epic beard. It's just not in this reality. Is true. This is true. It's either the hair or the beard. One of the two, bro. Come on. <laughs> All right. Uh, I want to. Yeah. There you <laughs> <laughs> Murph is follically challenged. We got you. <laughs> Uh, I want to introduce an old friend of mine uh, from the convention circuit days from way back in the uh, early 2000s, and I want to welcome Shane. Shane, welcome, man. Uh, thanks, Kevin. It's great to be here. Actually, this is actually my first podcast I've done. So uh, believe it or not, like out of all the kind of crazy adventures uh, I've had in and around entertainment, I've never actually done one of these before. And it's it's super fun. It's a topic you and I have been you know bantered about offline and in the real world uh a lot but um you know it's a it's a it's a sad it, it's cool to do this but it's a really sad topic that uh, it is it that, is uh, it is it's <laughs> and I'll, we'll get into that but uh it's good to have you i know how passionate you are about eddie van halen and van halen and of course that genre in particular so it's good to have you man thank you um now i could not do this without my lovely fiance aaron because i know that she's a big van halen fan and she's got a great story coming up uh Thanks for coming on, Aaron. That's all right. I actually have grown out my hair because I'm still in lockdown. <laughs> Yay, go Victoria in Australia. Everyone hates us. <laughs> yeah, no. Still in lockdown, still in our 5K radius. Well, we've fan. had uh, a lot of road trips that have included many Van Halen songs. So, Oh, it has. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah there was it in the wedding list. There were wedding songs. Yes. Um, the delayed wedding list. Let's just the say delayed wedding. <laughs> the delayed wedding. Yes. No, but, it's uh, great. You know, I love this one. We've, we've had a lot of fun. And uh, even though it is a sad day or a sad, sad day the other day, I still think it's a it's going to be a great way of celebrating his life because what an amazing life he had. Wow. This is very true. Yeah. Well, before we get into the main topic, you know, before we head to – Hollywood Sunset Strip or hit up Gazzari's or the Troubadour, or the Roxy, the Cat House, the Whiskey a Go Go, and later get our drinks on at the Rainbow Bar and Grill or Rock and Roll Denny's. I want to give you some contact info first. First of all, Fandom Podcast Network is now on YouTube. Please join us there. Search, give us a subscribe there. And uh, all of our audio podcasts will, of course, go to YouTube. And uh, we'll be doing some, uh, sp we've been doing some special programming as well uh, that is exclusive to YouTube. So make sure you check that out. Search Fandom Podcast Network. Uh, this is the Hair Metal Podcast. We also have an awesome Facebook group. Please search Hair Metal Podcast Fandom Group. We'll get you in there. You can also find us on Twitter at Hair Metal Cast and email us at hairmetalpodcast at gmail.com. The uh, Hair Metal Podcast, of course, is under the Fandom Podcast Network umbrella of awesome, plenty awesome shows there following all types of fandom. You can find that master feed at fpnet.podbean.com. And also there is a Podbean app. You can also download the Fandom Podcast Network shows on there. 
Uh, also, the Fandom Podcast Network is now on all major podcast platforms. Please give us a rate review on uh, your podcast platform, especially on Apple iTunes and uh, uh, Apple Podcasts. Please uh, search Fandom Podcast Network and please leave us a rate review. My name is Kevin. I am on Twitter and Instagram at Spartan underscore Phoenix. Murph, where can we find you on social media? Yeah, you can find me at at underscore Murph on the Twitters, and you can find me uh, anywhere you find a podcast by just searching for Murph's Fan Cave on any podcast service, and you'll find uh, the Murph's Fan Cave Network. If you don't like the Raiders, it's probably not a good spot for you, but if by chance you're a Raider fan, come check us out. Awesome, awesome. Shane, where can we we find you on social media? Uh, It's just Shane DeFries at Twitter. Shane DeFries on Twitter. Awesome. And Aaron, where can we find you? You're on Instagram, correct? Yes, under Audrey Worm. Cool. And Kyle, where can we find you? You can find me right here, right now, on Twitter at AKyleW or on Instagram at AKyleFandom. I see what you did there as you're running with the devil. Well done, mm-hmm. sir. Well done. I like that. <laughs> uh, the life wasn't so simple, huh, Kyle? Oh, <laughs> nice. Nice. Uh, there's a way you, you can support us in addition, of course, to following us on uh, the Fandom Podcast Network YouTube channel. Uh, please head on over to T Public, search Fandom Podcast Network. We've got some great logos from all of our shows, including hair metal. You get your own hair metal t shirt. That'd be a great way to support us. But let's get right into the show, guys. We lost a. Uh, um, Gosh, there's so many words. Uh, Murph, you texted me. You said, dude, we're going to do a uh, hair metal uh, podcast tribute shows. Please count me in. I'm in. Let me be honest with you. When you sent me that text, that text, it was too soon. <laughs> I, I, well, and I, and I put that in there. I think too, I said at the, you know, I think it's kind of fresh, but yeah, I, I, I was just like, man, oh, this hurts. But you know, as a, as the next day went on and I was talking with Kyle, I'm like, I think we need to do this. So, um, before we get into our initial reactions, uh, I just want to mention about Eddie Van Halen. He was born in Amsterdam. Uh, Edward Ludwig Van Halen was the son of Jan Van Halen and Eugenia Van Beers. Uh, in 1962, the fam- the Van Halen family moved from the Netherlands to the United States, settling in Pasadena, California. Eddie and his older brother, Alex Van Halen, were uh, naturalized as U.S. citizens. The brothers learned how to play piano as children. Starting at the age of six, they commuted from Pasadena to San Pedro to study with an ed- elderly piano teacher named Stasis Kavatsis. Eddie revealed in an interview that he had never been able to read music. Instead, he learned from watching and listening. For example, during recitals of Bach or Mozart, he would improvise from 1964 through 67. He won first place in the annual piano competition held at Long Beach City College. His parents wanted the boys to be classical pianists, but Eddie liked rock music much better. When Alex began playing guitar, Eddie bought a drum kit for himself. However, after he heard Alex's performance of the Safari's drum solo in the song Wipeout, he gave Alex a drums and began learning how to play the electric guitar. According to him, as a teen, he would often practice while walking around at home with his guitar strapped on or sitting in his room for hours with the door locked. Eddie and his brother Alex formed the first band with three other boys, calling themselves the Broken Combs, performing at lunchtime at Hamilton Elementary School in Pasadena, where he was in the fourth grade. He would later say that this was, the, this was when he first felt the desire to become a professional musician. Eddie and his brother Alex formed a band in 1972. Two years later, the band changed its name to Van Halen and at the same time became a staple of the Los Angeles music scene while playing at well-known clubs like the Whiskey A Go-Go. In 1977, Warner Brothers offered Van Halen a recording contract. Before we mention and talk about his death, uh, Shane, from what I remember too, wasn't Van Halen one of the house bands at like Gazzari's or something? Because I know they made the rounds. They were, they were, uh, they were the house band at Gazzari's and, you know, in, in reading a bunch of interviews, mostly with Roth is he would say that they would play like every night of the week and something like three or four shows, like they would come in at something like four o'clock in the afternoon and basically play till the end of the night. Yeah. Um, yeah. Five or six nights a week. That's- yeah. And I, re- I remember too, when he started doing that finger tapping thing and, in, in basically innovating it. It wasn't the first, he wasn't the first person to do it. Uh, that is, there's a famous story that is, uh, his brother, Alex said, dude, do that with your back face to the audience. So they can't see how you're doing it. 
<laughs> yeah, and he did. That's 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 actually true. He used to play in the club days. He would play with his back. Um, God, that would have drove me nuts, Murph. Hearing that, you're like, dude, how are you doing that? <laughs> Isn't it so cool though that like the work ethic that these guys had, and don't you think that that might be something that's missing in a little bit of today's rock and roll? And I'm not going to go all get off my lawn, you know what I mean here. But like with some of the newer bands, like you can get famous on YouTube just like that, and the whole notion of like gigging around and playing, you know, being or having a residency at a, at a at a local club or like playing all the the all the parties they did and all the different things they did, like that's what honed them. So that by the time they got signed, by the time they hit the mainstream, like this band was hitting on all cylinders by the time they got there. I think that that's a um, sadly a thing that's missing nowadays in rock and roll. You just, or at least you don't see it as much. We see some younger bands like dirty honey that are kind of coming up in that way. But uh, really th th that notion of like putting together, frankly, an entire career before you ever even, we even knew who you were right. nationally yeah. like, is amazing. Yeah. Well, let's get into uh, the reactions to his death, but I, I want to uh, mention some uh, famous rock legends and uh, celebrities and what they said. Uh, this was from an article uh, on Us Magazine because there were some great uh, uh, tweets and mentions here. Um, in loving memory, celebrities took to social media to mourn the loss of Van Halen co-founder Eddie Van Halen, who died at age 65 on Tuesday, October 6th, after a long battle with throat cancer. The Rock's legend son, Wolfgang Van Halen, Wolfie as he's known by, confirmed his passing, writing, quote, I can't believe I'm having to write this, but my father, Edward Van Halen, has lost his long and arduous battle with cancer this morning. Wolfgang, 29, who joined his, ba his father's band in 2006 as a bassist, added, quote, he was the best father I could have ever asked for. Every moment I've shared with him on and off the stage was a gift. My heart is broken, and I don't think I'll ever recover from this loss. I love you so much, Pop, end quote. Valley Bertinelli, uh, who was married to the guitars from 81 to 2007, uh, shared Wolfgang, uh, um, um, shares Wolfgang, of course, with the late rocker. He commented on his son's post with 20 broken heart emojis. Uh, oh, man. Um, the Netherlands native who founded Van Halen in 72 was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in January 2007. He married uh, Janie Lozweski two years later. The songwriter revealed his throat cancer diagnosis in 2019, nearly two decades after having part of his tongue removed due to a battle with uh, tongue cancer. Gene Simmons uh, jumped in saying, my heart is broken. The Kiss singer and guitarist tweeted, Eddie was not only a guitar god, but generally beautiful soul. Rest in peace. Uh, if I remember correctly, too, uh, he's been quoted as saying that he kind of discovered them, if I remember correctly. Uh, do you remember this, Murph? Yeah, absolutely. He's the one that saw them, I think. And yeah. I don't know if it was Zari's or one of those local uh places down there in los angeles and he's the one that kind of brought them in and and even at one point eddie was gonna go potentially go replace ace freely when ace that's freely right yeah he, yes. he wanted yeah. to he wanted to play with them. i think they flew him to new york to do some recording and stuff like that so do you remember that chain you were hearing I, about I, that? I do um yeah i think it was gazaris is that uh you know um simmons found them uh thought they were talented flew them out to new york recorded their first demos with them and uh, I forget what the guy's name is. Who was he? Took them and took them to Kiss's management. Yeah. Um, uh, what's his name? A, a Bill Coin was that it? And and he was like, and then he passed. Like all the people that, that Simmons walked him into were like, uh, it passed on him. And they were they were so. I mean, nothing really came out of the the Gene Simmons thing other than the demos. They were back playing clubs. Um, when just as a, on kind of a lark, Ted Templeman walked in and saw them, um, and then signed them within a day, within like 24 hours. Yeah. yeah. Ted Templeton, legend, legend. Uh, some other celebrities and rock stars that chimed in on Twitter here. We got George Takei. Mm -hmm. He, he chimed in Elton John, Steven Tyler. He said he changed the course of guitar, whammy bar, rock and rhyme, a game changer is melodic. And his melodic crazy was all over the top. So we'll miss you, Eddie. Love from above. Uh, actress uh, Viola Davis, she chimed in. Tommy Lee said, rest in peace, my friend. A man who changed guitar playing forever. F no. Uh, Nikki Six said, crushed. I'm so effing crushed. Ozzy Osbourne, too. He, he chimed in. Sebastian Bach, Brett Michaels, Lenny Kravitz, John Mayer, Jimmy Kimmel, Kenny Chesney, um, Pierce Morgan, um, 
Beach Boys le- legend Brian Wilson and of course Sammy Hagar said heartbroken and speechless the former Van Halen guitarist wrote alongside a photo with his friend my love to the family David Lee Roth said what a great long trip it's been Eddie Van Halen's bandmate and the lead singer of the group wrote via Instagram alongside a black and white throwback photo um, of the pair backstage but let's get into our first reactions here guys this is why I've had you guys on here can I just can I just mention yeah, another one of the, the one that got me as a celebrity? I follow him on Instagram. Is the actor yes. Patrick Wilson, who is an amazing singer himself. He's done a lot of musicals, but he put up a, a fan picture that he must have gotten off Eddie Van Halen saying, and I'm I'm going to have to take out some of the swear words, but it's like Patrick, what can I say? Bleeping great, all my best, Eddie. And Patrick Wilton Wilson wrote at the bottom, no, you were bleeping great. You defined my musical use. Concerts, lip syncs, mixtapes, posters and cover bands. Van Halen has been a huge part of my life for about 40 years. Still is because he does a band, a cover band with his brothers that he tours with and does these, you know, songs. I've listened to VH2 front to back yesterday. There aren't enough words to express not only the sadness but the joy his music brought to me and millions, that's was what I'll learn. And he wrote a quote from saying from Eddie, if it's too loud, <laughs> you're too old. And I, just, I really love that. I thought it was, a, it was a beautiful sort of fan, um, you know, even though he is in his own right a genius with some of his voices, you know, that he sings, but, you know, his fandom to it's Eddie nice was, to, yeah, it, it might have been nice to know. And yeah, no, it's nice to know another side of Patrick Wilson, the actor, that he's a musician as well, and he's a, obviously a big fan. So, I, th- I think it's amazing when you see these these stars that they can also get starry eyed mm-hmm. themselves. Well, you think that you know, oh well, you know, I know Eddie Van Halen, and it's nothing, but that's is like a big well, fan. Aaron, so yeah, it was. Just Aaron, a few let's go to you first. Uh, your first reaction of Eddie's death, and some maybe some of these celebrity reactions. What was your take uh, as soon as you found out? I think I saw it on, must have seen it on Instagram. It would have been first thing in the morning because, of course, we're in, we would have found out first. Not really because we're ahead of you. But, um, well, I won't say. I'll do the another bleep, 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 bleep. Pretty much how Hugh Grant said it at the start of um, <laughs> Four Weddings and a Funeral. And, uh, yeah, I was, yeah, it was, it was crushing. It was, you know, we've discussed this on, um, I mean, I'm probably more of a movie fan than a music fan. I don't, you know, I, I love music and there's bands I follow, but I'm not a religious. I know everything about them um, that I do like it with movies. But I do feel, and especially I put up something on Facebook that Generation X is in mourning because that's the generation of who Eddie Van Halen, like you could have been a bit older and it probably sort of, yeah, or you were too young, but us Generation Xs was just, that was it. This is what we grew up with in a time where we didn't have mobile phones and Twitter and the internet. It was just, it was just a simpler time. And it was this time of listening to songs, which we still listen to. We can't get out of our 80s bubble because it just brings back great it was memories good. And, and it's it still up is. <laughs> and it was good. You know, it was it was this, as you said, they they worked it. They worked the circuit. They had to do these, you know, gigs. I mean, I've got a friend of mine who saw ACDC at his school dance in wow. Ringwood. Like you know, in the 70s. Oh, yeah, I saw ACDC, they played at our school dance. Like, this wouldn't happen now, you know. Um, and and funny enough, before COVID, it was sort of coming back because the internet took away, I think, the 90s and the 2000s. Everybody could just live on their laurels of, you know, didn't have to tour because I could make all my money doing albums and then downloading came and Spotify came and it was like, oh, crap, I'm not making so much money, so now I actually have to get off my ass and tour and that's how I'm going to make my money. And you saw all these old acts literally clean off their, you know, guitars and go, we're going to have to hit the circuit again. But then, of course, you know, this has all changed again and it's and different ways of doing it, you know, but... It was it was it was like a little piece of my going back to what you said. It was like a little piece of my 
teenage growing up years died. Yeah, that, that, like the day the music died, we're going to close. Point. Um, I'm going to go to Shane and then you next, Murph. Shane, uh, your first reactions. Um, you know, I, I saw it come across my feed about 20 minutes after it got announced, and it just was a gut punch. I mean, it was just, you know, I, I've been fortunate at this point. I've never had a, a loved one or family member pass away. Um, and I remember being, you know, sad when Bowie or Prince or Robin Williams died. But this was just, or even Carrie Fisher, but... And I remember how I felt then. And that was kind of the closest I'd really got to emotion for a celebrity that I didn't know. But this was was different. This was a, a just a, you know, it kind of just felt like, wow, that's the end. Like, like, you know, there's a there's a kind of a special time period in the late 70s where so many things came up uh, that were just that stayed with us our whole lives. I mean, it was, you know, Van Halen one was a year Bef- um, a year after, a year before, Star Wars and Van Halen basically started at the same time, for example. Like all this, you know, George Lucas and Van Halen and Steven Spielberg. And, you know, there's these kind of like small group of, of creators in film and music that that they've just, they've, they've been like a friend that you don't know your whole life. And there's something so much more intimate about Eddie in that, I mean, how many thousands and thousands of hours of my life have I spent with this guy in the car and in plane, you know, at dances, at clubs, at wherever. I mean, and, you know, concerts, um, you know, and, and to be honest, yeah, it's, it was weird. It was just weird of feeling like this, this, I don't remember a life before Eddie Van Halen. And, and, uh, you know, to say it's the soundtrack of Gen X's life is, there's just, there is no other comparison. It would be like, if you're a huge basketball fan, what would it be like when Michael Jordan passes away? I mean, like there's only a few people in the world that are like that. And, and that's a part of, you know, our life that's just over. And it's, uh, yeah, it was, it was, yeah. it was hard to not tear up for, you know, the first couple of days. It's still hard. So, Yeah. And I'm tearing up now, so thank you for <laughs> okay, that. Okay, uh, we're, we're feeling emotions here. Let it ride. Keep, keep, keep it real. Murph, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, this briefly on your recent one of your recent shows here, uh, and Shane had mentioned, uh, you know, Carrie Fisher hitting us hard because I know how big a Star Wars fan you are, uh, just like Shane is. Uh, but what what was your first reactions, man? Yeah, I thought that was a great point that Shane made that there's a lot of symmetry there. And even to extend it out further between like the Raiders, Star Wars and Van Halen, like all became relevant and very successful all at the same time. And so um, the three celebrity deaths that have rocked me in my life have been Kenny Stabler was the first one uh, and then Carrie Fisher and then now Eddie Van Halen to where I was like actually emotional about somebody that I had no connection with other than connection to their art. And so, um, you know, and, and we've, you know, those of us on the show here, um, you know, we're of a particular age, as Aaron said, we're Gen Xers. And so, you know, we've seen a lot of major people pass away. We've seen, you know, Michael Jackson, Aretha Franklin, you know, Chris Farley, Frank Sinatra, like you go on and on. There's been some, you know, some massive pop culture icons that have passed on, but those are the only three that have really hit me. And I'm with you too, Shane. Like I didn't even, like, I kind of, I got weepy about it at first. And then last night I was watching more live. I went back to the show. I'm wearing the shirt uh, today from when I saw Van Halen in 2012 in, in Nashville. And I was watching back through um, some footage, some fan footage of his solo. And I got teary again. It was just like, and I'm not a cry guy. Like I'm not a weepy guy, but like, there's something about it that like, like you all have said that Eddie was our guy. Like, I mean, we're all big fans of music. That's why we're on this show. And some of my all time favorite bands are Zeppelin and the stones and the Beatles and the who, and like ACDC and like all these bands. But Eddie was ours. Eddie was ours. Eddie was our first guy. That wasn't our parents' band. Van Halen was our band. And Eddie was our guy. Like, it wasn't Jimi Hendrix. It wasn't Janis Joplin. It wasn't people that were in the... And then if you fast forward from there, and then, you you know, because quickly, Van Halen ran into the early 90s and where you get Alice in Chains and Soundgarden and Pearl Jam and Nirvana and blah, 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 blah. Like, Eddie, like, Aaron, it was perfectly said. That was... It's almost like an... Almost an isolated time where... And, and the longevity within that time, because there were other bands like the police and other bands that came up big in that time too, but, but there was something about Van Halen. And, and so 
I'm with you. It, it rocked us. It, it really rocked us. And this is wonderful to be on this show to talk about this because I feel like it's kind of cathartic to share in this, but it's sad. Like I'm kind of like a happy go lucky, like chuckle it up kind of guy, but dang, man, this one stung. This one hurts, man. It, even though it was kind of expected. And I hate to say that too, because we know the guy had been battling this for a long, long time, but Shane, like you, man, I, it came across my feet. I was on the treadmills at the gym and I got a notification on iHeartRadio. And all it said was guitar legend. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, uh, just you knew, you knew what happened. Yeah, yeah well said, Murph. Well said. Uh, Kyle, I found out from you. And I have the text right here. You sent it to me saying, um, Eddie Van Halen dead at 65 from cancer. And you had a, a frowny emoji. And I said, OF. And then you said, 2020 can bite me. Your reaction. For me with Van Halen, because I think I'm the youngest one here, um, um, my, my introduction to Van Halen kicked in around 1980 when 1984 came out. And I I'd heard a little Van Halen from my older half-sister, but that's where I'm hearing Jump and everything like that. But for me, the reason why Van Halen sticks out and why Eddie sticks out so much is because he really defined two points in my life. When I'm that young age and I'm first really getting introduced to music for the first time, Van Halen was one of the first bands that really stood out in my memory with, with everything in 80 jump was everywhere. Um, living in Alaska too, at that time, we didn't get concerts, <laughs> you know, who comes to Alaska to do a concert, <laughs> especially in the eighties. But then we, I went into my years in high school and that's when for unlawful carnal knowledge came out. And I just remember when the video for right now came out how everybody in my high school just reacted and how powerful that video was and how many, how that impacted it. And to me, Van Halen was probably the band that defined my MTV generation more, more than, more than anything else from this, from my start of it to when it ended. And one of the things that you always remember is just the energy Eddie had and the, I mean, Obviously, I, I, in my opinion, he's, except maybe for Jimi Hendrix, there's not a better guitarist out there. There's not a more unique, original guitarist out there. But he was always so exuberant. He, you ne and just when he played, whether he was playing with Van Halen, playing solo, um, he did that great solo on Saturday Night Live, which was phenomenal. Um, there was just always this energy that it brought out of you. And I, nobody else brought that energy out like Eddie Van Halen did. And when I heard he passed and I sent you the text, it just felt like, wow, there just went a major section of my life. There, there went this major, major musical influence. And I mean, I, I, I love Van Halen, whether it's Roth, whether it's Hagar. I mean, one of my favorite songs is actually one of the very last things Sammy did with them, which was Human Beings, which was actually on the soundtrack for the movie Twister. But, you know, it's and what it always was. It was the guitar that brought you in. It was Eddie who brought you in. He, David had his uniqueness and his energy. Sammy had what Sammy has, which is unique in its own way. But it was always Eddie. You hear those guitar riffs. You you hear that opening synthesizer to jump. It was always Eddie. And it just it just felt like you knew inside we had lost something. And then seeing all those people react and people who you wouldn't expect to say Eddie Van Halen had an impact on them to be talking about. It. You mentioned like Viola Davis. You, you wouldn't think Viola Davis would have an impact from Eddie Van Halen. It just shows you he was somebody who transcended everything with his music. And that is when you know you've lost somebody special. When you have that reaction across the board from people who you wouldn't even think of it. And it, it was just, it was heartwarming. It was sad. And it, it, it just... For me, it made me stop and be reflective of a lot of memories and uh, a lot of great music and just what it's like. And you just think at his age, so young, he still had so much more he could have given. And, I, you know, I also thought about his son, who is in his own way, a unique talent as well. But, yeah, it was just like there, there was just a sense of loss and you maybe couldn't even really explain it. It just was like just all of a sudden there was a hole. Yeah. Well said. Uh, it's a gut punch. I think you said that Shane, uh, it, it hurt, you know, and, uh, for all the same reason you guys said, it's a piece of our history it, of our history, what we shared, it, it was personal for us. And just like millions of other guitar players, he was like our first guitar guy. 
You know, we were too young to remember Jimi Hendrix. We learned about him. We respected him. But it was Eddie. Eddie was that guy. And I remember uh, when I first started playing guitar, I, I would not, I knew I couldn't play like him. I knew I, I couldn't do the fretboard like him. But the one thing I did get from him was how to hold a guitar. Make sure it looked cool when you slung that thing on, you know, and how you moved around on stage. And, you know, I couldn't do the jumps that he did and the splits in the air and stuff like that. He did. Of course, he ended up paying for it later with, with surgery on his hip. But it was how you hold the guitar and how it became a extension of you. And so anyway, well said, guys, I want to get into your personal Van Halen fandom, how it started. And I want to combine it with your own personal Eddie Van Halen fandom in particular. Um, Aaron, I'm going to go to you. Um, okay, so I would have probably been as well, I'm the girl, and um, I think that I would have heard of Van Halen. I think 1984, which would have been when I was 14, was the big that was like the most commercial. Um, I think of uh, Van Halen did a lot of covers before that, but in a lot of their albums, um, but that was the big one. And we, what was it? It was Jump and Panama, and it was it was Hot for Teacher, which I still do in a cycle class, and everyone nearly dies. Um, go as fast as Eddie. Um, but yeah, so 1984, and then of course the next one. Then of course at the height of that, David Lee Roth leaves. And then you've got, you know, 5150 and OU812 and, and, and I love both, you know. I know that there's a rivalry and we'll talk about that later. But that was where I probably listened to more of the Hagar stuff because it starts getting older. I start getting the car. I've got the stereo in the car. We made a mixed. Um, I dated the boyfriends who were wanting to, you know, be Eddie, and we'd sit there and try and do the start to hop to teacher extremely slowly. <laughs> but you know what it was? It was a time of no internet, no PlayStations, maybe if you had Pong, but really who was going to stay in all day. Um, and that's what you did. Kids went out and they wanted to be guitarists. It got the girls. You wanted to be in the band. That's how you picked up girls. And you sat and you would sit there for hours and practice to be Eddie. And he was cute. And he was this sort of guy you could be him. It wasn't like he was so relatable, you know. And I think later on I ended up seeing Australia or Melbourne got a band called Hans Valen in the 90s and they were a Van Halen cover band and they were world class. They had one of the best drummers in the world in it called Virgil Donati. He's an Australian guy. He does a lot of drum clinics, very technical. And, um, and a guy called Jack Jones, his name's Erwin Thomas, but he changed it for Jack Jones. I can see why. But he was an 18-year-old guy who had the most amazing voice and could play like Eddie. And they played in Melbourne and they became huge. And that's when I got to know a lot more of the earlier stuff of Van Halen. But he put something up on Instagram, which I have to say I may have watched 95,000 times. And he was talking about how Eddie was two notes and you knew it was him. That's how you described him. And I just, I need to just read this out. I just screenshotted it. Come back to where I screenshotted it. Where is it? And it's wrote, he wasn't going to post and he put up a live thing with the music from When It's Love and it was the guitar solo. And he writes, there are one, of, this is one of the most beautiful, be 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 start again, beautiful guitar solos of all time. One of the things that has always struck me immediately about Eddie's guitar playing is just how strong and identifiable, identifiable it is. In the first two notes, it's unmistakable who the author is. And that's what you got from Eddie. Two notes and you knew yeah. by the sound, by the texture, that that was Eddie. And it's an amazing post and he cries and it that's destroyed me. But... I think with that, that's how we all got to learn through Eddie and that's how I did it from earlier on. But it wasn't until that band and Jack playing and not as good but as close as he could at 18 to Eddie that I learned 
more of Van Halen. And I hope to find, I think I've got a videotape somewhere and I must be able to put it on YouTube, but it was amazing. So. That's awesome. That's really cool. Shane, I want to go to you on this. I know how big of a Van Halen fan you are, and we're going to get into your personal story here, but where did it start for you? And uh, where did Eddie Van Halen, uh, what did he himself mean to you? So my first real memory of the band was, I, was, I mean, I mean, 1984 came out actually on New Year's Eve, 1983. And I was in fifth grade that year. And it's the first real music memory. Um, like you jump in Panama and that whole, you know, 90, 84 a year, it was just everywhere. Like, like I remember, I don't actually have any memory at any point really throughout the rest of school with maybe the exception of like Def Leppard's hysteria late in high school of like walking into a school and seeing every single person with a con- the same concert shirt on. And, and then I, I remember that album when I was young and then I didn't really get into music until I was probably in junior high a few years, a couple of years later, seventh, eighth grade. And then I got 5150, um, which was probably the second or third album I ever bought. And at that point, um, like Hysteria was out and 5150 and OEA when two had just come out. And the first two concerts I ever saw was um, the second to the last show on the Hysteria tour. And I was so angry because I, I was I didn't get to go to Monsters of Rock in 88 when I got, they were playing stadiums and I didn't have anyone to go with. My parents weren't going to let me go see like this 100,000 person convention or, or concert. And on a lark, they, you know, they only played like the, you know, really, really big football venues. And they went and played Portland after Monsters of Rock, where I grew up as a one off just because they liked Portland and we're like, we're sorry. We didn't, we weren't able to come through here on the summer, but we're going to come play your city. Cause you guys are always awesome to us. <laughs> and, uh, and there's actually kind of a fight. You can look it up on YouTube. There's actually like a whole YouTube video I found about a year ago of them talking about playing that show in Portland. And, uh, you know, at that point I was like, okay, I'm going to see you every single time you go on tour, which I, I did with, with the nominal exception of the Sharon, you know, era, <laughs> which I was angry at them about that. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, that was, that was kind of the beginning. And it was, it was, it was weird in that that band, I mean, them and Def Leppard have been kind of like my two, but like even, even Def Leppard, who I've seen probably more times, but a couple more times than Van Halen, but but like I would check out the Van Halen news desk and like I treated that the same way I treated my other non-music fandoms like Star Wars and D&D. And, and uh, you know, I think the fact that there was also a lot of like soap opera drama with Van Halen, it was there was there was kind of more a little bit than just the music to like, oh, what's happening here? Who are they going to play with? And and some of it was, you know, it was entertaining and it was frustrating. But, um, you know, there was always something new to hope for. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, Murph. I know you're a fan, but I'm curious to uh, to know your early uh, history with Van Halen here. Yeah, so I've, I've been a music junkie my whole life. I'm not a musician. I can't sing. I can't play a lick of an instrument, but I'm a music junkie. And my dad was an old hippie from the Bay Area. So was my mom. And so I grew up on Jefferson Airplane and, the again, the Stones and the Beatles and the Who and, and, and you know, the Doors and all that stuff. Uh, so I was always into music a lot. And then uh, my stepdad, um, my, my mom remarried, my stepdad... Uh, and her got a, got a place and he had this huge cassette tape collection. And I'm like, I was born in 73 and this is probably like 81, maybe whatever, whatever year, what year did, did yeah. Yeah. 81. Cause it would have been after Van Halen too. Anyways. And so I would, I would go through his tapes and like, that's the first time I heard Zeppelin. And that's the first time I heard blind faith and like, you know, the stones, brown sugar and like all these like amazing albums. And one of those was Van Halen too. And I got a Walkman for Christmas that year or whatever version of it, whatever, some kind of headphone player thing. And I grabbed Van Halen 2 and plugged it in. And for whatever reason, it was, you know, played up to this, which is, I think, the last song on the album, if I remember right, is Beautiful Girls. And that was my first. So I'm like nine years old and listening to Beautiful Girls for the first time and was just like, I'm like that opening lick of that song. I was like, what is this? Like, this is insane. So 
like that. And so immediately I just started scooping up as much Van Halen as I could get a hold of. And I'll never forget one year. And I can't remember if it was, it must have been the following Christmas. I asked for all I wanted was Van Halen tapes. That's all I wanted. Like, and so I got like women and children first and Van Halen one and all, and you know, fair, fair warning and, and whatnot. And so like it, it, I was just so sucked in the first record I ever bought. The first, uh, um, vinyl album I ever bought was 1984 and I still one of the best album covers of all time. But anyways, and so I'm like this little kid and I'm just like, just mesmerized by this band and lyrically and everything <laughs> else, to the point to where I'll tell you a funny story. So this is 1985. Lil Murph is in the seventh grade. And we used to have this thing for our, uh, at, at like lunchtime period in the quad at junior high school and Markham, uh, freaking junior high school in San Jose, California, where we used to have this, this lunch period. And so you could put in your name to be like the DJ, like to play music during lunch. Right. So I put in for it and I get it. And the first song I play, and this is blaring over the whole school during lunchtime, I'm playing fools from women and children first that contains lyrics like, well, I ain't about to go to school and I'm sick and tired of golden rules. And, uh, uh, I just can't take it. My teachers all gave up on me. No matter what they say, I disagree. Like I'm blaring this stuff to these. Fr and it was like, it was one of the most, the best moments. I felt like such a freaking stud. Cause back in those days, it was like Debbie Gibson and Tiffany and whatever other kind of things were going on in the world. I don't even know. It might've even been before that, but you know what I'm saying? It was very like poppy kind of things. And here I am, you know, crunching out the dunk, 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 dun, 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 dun. you know what I mean? Like it was just, it was amazing. So I was hooked. And then the, to, to also echo what, what Shane said, 5150, like I, you know, I was aware of who Sammy Hagar was and I was very aware when the band broke up. I was also very aware when they got back together. I'll never forget that Rolling Stone article where it like, it was like a centerfold of Sammy and Eddie like embracing. And it was like the new version of Van Halen and blah, blah, blah. But then when I got that album, 5150, like I'm, I'm more of a Dave guy than I'm a Sammy guy, but 5150, like completely to me cemented them as the band and Eddie as a player as by far one of the all time greats. And when you listen to that album, like it starts off, you know, it's why can't this be love and whatever, but then you get to get up and it's like, Whoa, like, I mean, it's heavy. It's, it's, it's driving. It's so great. It's like Sammy's vocals, but Eddie's playing, especially the way that that song song begins and carries through. Like it just absolutely just, I mean, it, it, it wrecked. My, and so from that point forever, that they were my favorite band. And it really wasn't until like, you know, you mentioned some of the Gary Sharon stuff and even some of the latter Sammy stuff, like they kind of lost me a little bit. And, you know, in the nineties was a whole nother thing. There was a whole nother level of rock and roll that, that grabbed my attention for a long time. And, you know, and, and it felt like at a certain point, Van Halen stopped having fun, like, cause they're such a fun band. And I think that's what captivated me so much as a kid. When you listen to ice cream, man, and you listen to big bad bill and could this be magic and all these, like, there's so much diversity and playfulness in their music, happy trails and, all these things, it's so fun. And then they kind of stopped having as much fun and, and it sort of lost me. But anyways, that was the, the majority of, as a kid, just absolutely captivated me and, and, and still to this day uh, have, have remained that way as a middle-aged man. So I have a confession to make, guys. Um, I was born in 70, so I was 12 years old when 83 was coming around. And uh, I had four interests. I had the Los Angeles Dodgers, 80, became a Raiders fan, G.I. Joe, and Star Wars. I'm talking about 83 for a particular reason, because Star Wars came out Memorial Day weekend, 1983. The Us Festival in San Bernardino, California, was the following weekend. I had a friend of mine. He was about two years older than me. I looked up to him because he was a really good, uh, his name was Jim. He was a really good uh, skateboarder and I idolized him. And um, I wasn't into music really that much. The only music I would hear was 60s, 70s, 50s stuff that my parents would play on the radio and stuff like that. Uh, I didn't quite, I, I, I knew about MTV and I knew, but it was more like the pop stuff that I remember seeing. Cause we didn't have it at the house. I would go to a friend's house and I remember seeing some early videos, but metal really wasn't on there yet uh, when I was kind of checking in on it. But my buddy, Jim, 
there was a group of people that got tickets to see the us festival and uh, a couple people backed out. They couldn't go. So they had two tickets left. And so they, he said, Hey man, you want to come with this festival? And I was planning on staying with his, his house. I think his, his house overnight, my parents knew they thought he was cool. So they were fine with it. And then there was this other little uh, other kid that was like a year younger than me. And he says, do you want to go with this? This is going to be right. really cool. And I was torn because I wanted to go back and watch return of the Jedi again. <laughs> <laughs> that weekend and uh but i didn't want to disappoint him because I, I you know i looked up to this guy and so i said we said okay so I'll, but here's the thing i don't remember this concert i remember being there but i remember spending a lot of the time like i think we had really cheapo seats and i remember spending a lot of time with a younger kid because he was a star wars fan but it was on that sunday and that sunday was motley Crue, joe walsh ozzy osbourne judas priest triumph scorpions and van halen headlined and i have no memory of any of those guys i do remember coming back uh to school later on and people had us festival t-shirts and stuff like that but it wasn't until van halen 1984 came out on vinyl or on cd or whatever it was at the time my good my best one of my good friends cole at the time got that i think for christmas or whatever it was i'm like why is there a baby smoking what's up with that you know and he ended up playing it and of course then that kind of opened my mind to van halen and jump and all that kind of stuff but I, i didn't really get into them right away i got into uh quiet riot first that was like my first big like metal band that i got into and then it wasn't until a little bit later i started getting into <laughs> into uh van halen but i don't talk about that because i i don't want to lie and say oh i remember that in the background here i have that whole concert playing and i'm like i missed out <laughs> <laughs> but i came to appreciate him later on i eventually of course and i'll talk about when i saw him later but uh kyle before we move to the next question do you have a, any anything you want to re- uh, mentioned regarding um, your fandom of Eddie Van Halen. You kind of touched on it a little bit already. Yeah. Um, one of the things for me is, as far as my introduction to Van Halen was actually through a good friend of mine in elementary school. His name is Mark Arnett and he is a music savant. He can, you put an instrument in front of him, he can learn it in five minutes. And his family always had a piano or an organ and he, he was all in on jump, the song jump and his mission in life at that time, was to learn how to play jump, specifically Eddie's keyboards in that in that song. So that's being at his house, listening to Van Halen as he's learning this and le- watching him learn how to play this. It, it's funny when I think about it. I mean, I, I obviously Eddie so much guitar work, but two of my favorite Van Halen songs are ones where he was actually provided more keyboard than he actually did guitar work, and that's Jump itself and the song Dreams, and. Dreams always stands out for me because I remember the music video so well because they used the Blue Angels in the in the music video. Yeah, that was cool. And it was just such a cool video. Um, again, I go, I go back to Van Halen defines me in two different places in life. And, you know, the, the kid and in innocence and just discovering music is David Lee Roth and, and that version of Van Halen. But the one when you start learning appreciating music and seeing more of a meaning of music and really that was Sammy. And so truthfully... I love 1984, but for Unlawful Carnal Knowledge, it's always going to pr- probably be my Van Halen album because that was just the one that impacted me so much. But right. again, yeah. you guys have all Great hit album. it here. Yeah, you guys have all hit it here. I think one of the biggest keys to Van Halen was they were the fun band. They were amazing musically, but they were fun. They and that's a good show. That, that, that's always what stood out, whether it was just in concert, in videos, um, however they did it. They had an energy that was unique to only Van Halen and especially Eddie. And I, yeah. I think that's one of the things that I will always remember with Van Halen. Uh, the next question I want to ask you guys, I'm going to go to Aaron uh, first and then Shane, and then over to Murph. Uh, I want you to talk about your personal stories of seeing Van Halen or seeing Eddie and Van Halen in concert. And Aaron, you, <laughs> when I remember you telling me this story, which is funny because this was the time I remember seeing uh, him in concert with, of course, uh, um, Hagar is singing. You have a great story about your trip to New York. Yeah, um, I actually never saw him, and I've come to a realisation, and this happened to me with the Eagles, um, and I love the Eagles. I don't care if you think they smell of the road, but I never, I kept putting it off, kept putting it off, you know, oh, next year and next year, and then one of them dies. So when Don Henley came out, I made sure 
I went to see him and it was amazing and it was all wonderful. So I've, I've, I've cut to a part of my life that if someone's coming out or they're touring, go see him, don't put it off. Anyway, so I never did get to see Van Halen. They probably played here, they probably played there. I was, oh, next time, next time, next time, don't ever do that. But I have this story. So in 93, I just decided I'm 23 and I'm like, now I'm going to go to America and I'm like this person, I just go. I'm quite independent and I'm like, I'm just going to do it. And I met up with some friends and a girlfriend of mine decided we go to New York. So we went to New York and we were, uh, you know, there for a few weeks, as you do in 93. And she wanted to go and see, she wanted to go to this nightclub called The Limelight, which was in a church. And, yeah, so, and um, and they did one in England called The Slime Light, which is all gothy. But we went to this place and I want to go, I want to go. And there was, it, I don't remember, like Kevin, you have these things where there's, cele- you know, you remember parts but not the whole thing. So I remember that we were going just to go, not because of anything. So I don't remember if we knew this was going to happen or we just went. So I remember going there and I remember when we went in, it was like 20 or 30 bucks. And back then that was like expensive. I'm like, and I moaned. That's more than a concert ticket back then. Yeah. <laughs> like you go to places like eight bucks. This is like 93, 20. It was, it was either, I don't think it was 50, but it was either one of the We went in there and I spent the whole time doing, I can't believe how expensive it is. So expensive. God, what are we? We're just here at the nightclub. And I remember it, it was sort of like around the edges there were bars and restaurant and there was even a, a like a, a shop where you could get T-shirts and the limelight. And then down in the middle there was a dance floor and a stage. And I remember then suddenly people were like all moving to something was going to happen on stage. So we got down stage and I'm probably still moaning about why is it costing so much. And on walks this guy. And he just starts playing a solo. And I hear, that's Eddie Van Halen. And I'm like, oh, what? And he plays Eruption. And then it goes into Girl, You Really Got Me. And on walks Vince Neil. And they play the song. And I think they might have done one other. And then they walked off. And I never moaned about how much that place cost ever again. And that was it. (laughs) They appeared. And then they left. And I was like, and I don't know whether or not Vince Neil stayed and someone else came in and played his band. I feel like going back a bit more, I was thinking about it, I think that might have happened, but definitely Eddie came out, played a song, and he might have walked off and then whatever Vince Neil's guitarist because he might have stayed on for a bit and that's the reason why my girlfriend went because she was a massive Motley Crue fan. But definitely that was it. And I just remember standing there going, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, I can understand that one. Yeah, I, uh, if I knew that was going to happen, I would have paid at least fifty bucks for that. Oh, no, no, it was totally <laughs> worth it. It was just so funny of stand. I can I can sit there with us walking around, then the crowd getting together, and then standing there, and then coming out, and then Vince Neil came out, and then it was like, yeah, okay, I'll shut up now. I'm shutting up, and that was my, that was my only time. That that's a great story, and I I love it. When you told me that, I was floored. Uh, Shane, I want to go to you. You have a couple of stories and one you posted recently on your face, Facebook group. Uh, feel free to start with whatever one that you did, but you had the distinction of uh, being at a particular concert. That's So, so yeah, I, I, I saw their last show um, on Hollywood Bowl, or at Hollywood Bowl on 2015. It was October, uh, what was it? October 4th. Or, uh, yeah, October 4th, 2015. You know, and it it was um, it was great. I don't I don't say it was their best show that I ever saw. I think the best one was was the From Awful Carnal Knowledge tour. That- but just to clarify, uh, it was uh, it was David Lee Roth was back in the band, and uh, it it was um, uh, Wolfie on bass, right? Correct. This was, yeah. I think, their third tour with Roth um, since he'd been back, and yeah, and it was it was the last show, and as kind of a just on a lark, I, I pulled out my iPhone and recorded. I knew the jump was the last song and I recorded the last song, not 
you know, not thinking about it. It's like, Hey, I'm going to like, I'm going to have a, just a video of this. And that ironically ends up being the last song that Eddie ever performed live that, that I have, um, you know, a couple other kind of interesting, funny stories, you know, if you kind of live in LA, you know, kind of an Eddie Van Halen sighting randomly is sort of like the Holy grail of celebrity bump ins that you hope you'll have. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and I used to live uh, in Studio City, which is just down the hill from where Eddie's 5150 studio is off of Coldwater Canyon. And the, he would he would come down to go to like a 7-Eleven to pick up cigarettes. He was notorious for doing this. And every time I would go in there, at least two or three times, the guys would be like, oh, you just missed him. He was here like 20 minutes ago. It's like, <laughs> Jesus Christ. This happens like, like three times. I'm like, and... and and then one of my girlfriends at the time, her mom was a photographer and, and we broke up. And then like, oh, I don't know, less a month or so later, her mom gets invited to shoot this party that Eddie did, um, ironically enough, called The Gathering in like the early 2000s. I know kind of a Highlander thing. I don't, but and like, oh, so, well, that would have been nice because I could have like gone to that. But another girlfriend of mine was at one of like cryotherapy in LA, like where they, it's like kind of like this weird cold thing. And Eddie walks into her booth. So I'm like, I have all these people and like that have had the experience I wanted to have. But um, so just sort of a, I mean, I did meet Hagar once, which is kind of funny. I can tell that later, but. Um, no, you can tell now. Go ahead. I, I, yeah, you know, I, 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 for a little bit in early, it was 99 after he had um, broken up with the band and he was on the Red Voodoo album. And I worked for Sony's licensing division up in San Francisco for um, the, the division that made all like the merch, uh, all the merchandise and like tour shirts and stuff like that. And Hagar lived up in Marin County near George Lucas, and he would drive down and approve all his own stuff, which is pretty unheard of because these guys did like Madonna and Bruce Springsteen. And so Hagar would drive down and he would, if, if you know, San Francisco it was right on the Embarcadero. So like you could see Alcatraz out the window and he would drive his Ferrari down from whatever Lucas Valley, wherever he was, and he would park it up on the sidewalk, not caring if he got a ticket. So it wouldn't get bumped into. <laughs> and, and you could look out the window and be like, oh, Sammy's coming to approve his T-shirts because his Ferrari's on the sidewalk. And uh, and so, you know, I basically, the one of the times he came in, I basically begged my boss, please, 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 I won't ask to meet anybody ever else again and let me meet Sammy Hagar. And, and sure enough, so he took me in and super nice guy. It was, was, it was pretty brief, but he you know, shook my hand, said hello. Um, very short. Like I was surprised at how how short he was, but um, that was my my one direct interaction with the member. Shane, you're kind of a tall guy, so I think everyone's short. So, <laughs> so, but you know, I saw I saw a lot a lot of great concerts. Um, you know, the last one, I guess, in retrospect, was the most special. But the you know the first concert they did with Roth at Staples Center um, in 2007, that was. I wasn't expecting, I was, ex wasn't expecting a lot because Roth's kind of vocally challenged a bit live and, and he, and they sounded great. Like he must've clearly been working with a vocal coach and stuff I'd read later, but um, yeah, a lot, a lot of good, a lot of good concert, concert memories that I could probably talk about for an hour, but I'll, I'll move on to the next person. So. Okay, cool. Um, well, you know, it's funny, actually, we're thinking of doing a hair metal podcast specifically on both uh uh, Roth and of course, uh, Hagar Van Halen. So I'm going to keep you in mind for that. Uh, Murph, uh, your experiences, uh, seeing Van Halen live or Eddie. Yeah. So my first concert that I ever attended was, uh, May 27th of 1988. And that was, uh, David Lee Roth skyscraper tour and poison opened up for them. And, uh, and so, cause I was such a big Van Halen nut that I'm like, well, it's not Van Halen, but it's Dave. So I get to go, at least I get to go see Dave. And so, and our, and our, you know, 15 years old, man, it was my first show. And, and of course, and I, you know, dug poison after that, you know, uh, poison killed it. They were great. And so, you know, but Dave is, you know, he's riding a, you know, 20 foot surfboard around the top of the Oakland Coliseum with smoke coming out of it singing California girls. And it was like, 
you know, it was it was the, the showmanship of David Lee Roth was was there, and you know, Steve Vai was on guitar, Greg Bissonetti was his was drummer. Like it was a great band and a great experience. But it wasn't Van Halen. It was like, okay, this was cool to see Dave, but it wasn't Van Halen. And so it wasn't until uh, April, uh, excuse me, August twentieth. 1993, I got to see him live. And so that, uh, it's interesting, Aaron, you told the story about Vince Neil because that must have been that tour because Vince Neil's solo band was the opener for Van Halen that year. So uh, so this is at Shoreline Amphitheater in Mountain View, California. And uh, and so Vince Neil opens and then uh, and then this is the right now era of, of Van Halen. And, you know, um, Again, I'm more of a Dave guy, but I, I love the early Sammy stuff, especially 5150. And uh, and there's a lot of uh, OU812 that I like, and there's a lot of even for Unlawful Carnal Knowledge, some songs in there that I, I really love as well. But this was like, this was like, you know, Van Halen at like the height, like 93, man. This is like that right now time, like. This is like, you know, their Super Bowl ads, that whole Pepsi thing. Like, you guys remember all that? Like, it was a big oh, yeah. yep. deal. Like, Van Halen was the biggest band on the planet back then. And they were at different incarnations of their career, which is another remarkable thing about them, is that they became the biggest band in different versions as they went along. But anyways, but, but still, ultimately, the best part of that show, as big as it was and all that, was, was Eddie lighting a cigarette, sticking it in the neck of his guitar and sitting down on an amp and just freaking playing, man. It was like nobody else on stage, just a single spotlight on Eddie and him playing. And like, and that's what like, I'm getting chills right now. I was talking about it, man. Like I remember that crystal clear, man. It was, it was, it was an amazing experience. And, it, but I still felt like there was something like, okay, now I've seen Dave solo. I've seen the Sammy version of Van Halen, but I've never seen the original band. I've never, you're right. Well, then 2012 comes along. I live in Middle Tennessee now. I don't live in the Bay Area anymore. And they're playing Bridgestone Arena. And uh, and I went to go see them in 2012. That's the shirt that I'm wearing now. And uh, it was epic. And granted, it wasn't the, the original lineup. Michael Anthony wasn't there. But Wolfie did an amazing job on bass. And while I believe it was Shane mentioned that Dave had become vocally challenged the latter part of his singing career and was that night, um, you know, it was still one of the best concerts I've ever been to the showmanship, you know, cool and the gang opened, which is the most Van Halen thing ever. If you know, the history of this band cool and the gang opens up for them. They play. And like, and it wasn't just like, and, and I love that album too, by the way, that a different kind of truth is a great album. It's mostly because it's a lot of those songs came from the 1984 sessions and they recorded them for the new album. So there's so much of a, like a, 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 a feel of old Van Halen, but just Dave's showmanship, Eddie crushing. I mentioned the, the, the guitar solo earlier that kind of got me weepy last night. He starts off playing Eruption. He goes into Mean Streets. He comes back into Eruption. He goes into Cathedral. He goes back into Eruption. He goes into, uh, what is it? I always forget the name. It was 319 or 316, whatever the, the instrumental is on For Unlawful Carnal Knowledge. Goes into that, comes back into Eruption. Just... It's just amazing. And it just captivates. And it's interesting that at a concert like that, Bridgestone Arena, so there's, you know, 18,000 people there. And it got quiet. It got quiet during Eddie's solo because we had this reverence for this man of what his musicianship was. It's like no one wanted to scream and hoot and holler and miss a note or a lick or a, a movement. And it was just amazing. Of course, and then when he gets done, the place goes, Rah! The place goes in, insane, but there was just such an, it was such an amazing experience getting, getting to see them live, getting to see that version of the band live. And, um, they, they didn't disappoint, man. They, they absolutely did not di disappoint. And, um, I don't know. I, I'm gonna run out of words, but anyways, thank you for asking. It was just, that was such a, it, speaking of emotion, right? Like being able to connect all the way back, like, you know, after seeing them in different variations and whatnot to connect all the way back to that, it, it was pretty special, man. It was, it was, it was very cool. That uh, 1993 tour, there's something, some kismet about that going on there because that is when I finally saw Van Halen for the first time. And, and I'm not going to count the Us Festival because I don't remember it, you know, and I was, you know, I was thinking about Star Wars at the time. <laughs> so, but I, this is when I was a Van Halen fan at this time. And it was funny because like, I never saw early Motley Crue live either. 
So I think it was, I want to say the, the Irvine Meadows Amphitheater or the Long Beach Arena or something like that. That tour came through and I saw that one. And it was kind of like, well, finally I get to see Edward Van Halen, but not Roth. That's okay. I like Sammy. And I get to see part of Motley Crue, whatever. That's fine. That's cool too. So I, I remember uh, I really uh, enjoyed that that uh, first experience seeing uh, um, Van Halen and Eddie play live. And, and I remember specifically <laughs> that uh sammy came out uh there was some song that he strapped on a guitar for but he says i remember him saying you got to have big brass ones to throw a guitar on in this band if you're not eddie van halen (laughs) and i'll never forget that um real quick though i want to mention that one of the things that really impressed me that kind of really opened me up to exploring van halen more other than seeing my buddy cole buy that album of 1984 was that my that friend Jim and my friend uh, friend Jim played Spanish Fly, the uh, guitar solo that he does acoustically, and I was kind of trying. I was infatuated with guitar, obviously, but seeing hearing someone play that guitar, and it's kind of funny because when you listen to that, you hear him kind of mumble in that, so you're wondering like what's going on there, you know? It's like uh-huh. whoa, whoa, you know, but that 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 guitar solo alone just blew me away. But uh, come, uh, I want to say high school, I graduated in 88. I want to say this was either 88 or 87. We had a uh, really cool teacher that gave us, um, we were doing like, it was like social studies or something like that. And she said to us, I want you guys to pick a song and you have an opportunity. You can either write a report about it or you can do an oral report and play the song. And I was not a great writer. So I said, I'm going to do the oral report. She says, just let me know what song you're going to do. I said, I want to do um, Van Halen's Ice Cream Man. Nice. And she looks at me going, I don't think that's a good one to play for the rest of the school or the class. Uh, why don't you pick another? <laughs> and she was a Van Halen fan, which was cool. And I said, all right, what about Jamie's Crying? She's like, okay, that's cool. So I played the song. I dissected it uh, as best as I could. It, uh, you know, teenage, teenage, uh, Kevin at the time. And uh, I ended up getting like a, a, I think an A minus on that. I did a really good job, but I was like one of two other people that opted for the oral, oral report on that. So that, that was really cool. Uh, anyway, uh, Kyle, you have something? Well, I don't have a concert story, but there's something I want to talk about with Eddie real quick. If I, if I may here, mm-hmm. let's not forget that Eddie Van Halen became famous for corrupting America's all time sweethearts. <laughs> when Eddie Va- when Valerie Bertinelli married Eddie Van Halen, I remember the shock. It was like the shot heard around the world. Like, what is happening? He's he's defiling our America's sweetheart. One and day when, at a time. Um, he did it one day at a time. <laughs> and what was so cool was they I mean, even when they divorced, they still had this amazing, wonderful relationship and were great parents to to Wolfie, but just, I mean, their relationship defined kind of a generation of celebrity relationships before people were even made a huge deal about celebrity relationships. And it was just, it was so unique. It was so amazing. You could, and you could tell that whole time they were, whole time they, they, they truly loved each other and you never heard about it. You never, people, people respected that relationship. And, and even though a lot of people at first were like, what the heck's going on? They could see it as time went by. But I just I just remember the initial reaction when it came out that Valerie Bertinelli re- married Eddie Van Halen. Yeah, that was that was definitely big news. Uh, <laughs> uh, before we take our quick little break here, I uh, just want to go to you, Shane, real quick. I didn't know if there's anything else. I know you had some uh, I know you have a rich history with this band and uh, probably a lot of stories. I didn't know if there's uh, one other little anecdote you wanted to add. You know, I, there was there was two concert experiences that really were really mind blowing. I mean, I remember when, you know, for all awful carnal knowledge was kind of like my kind of like Kyle's. That was sort of my peak. Like, I think that was the band really, you know, at least with Hagar when they were at the top of their game. Pound Cake, man, love mm-hmm. this song and that video. Yeah, and he used the drill. He did the drill. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and, and Ted Templeman had co-produced that with him. That's why that ba- album sounded kind of rothish. Mm-hmm. is um it was that was that was his producing and i remember when they on that tour because they had refused to play jump with hagar they wouldn't do it um at the end of that first for unlawful carnal knowledge tour 
like they come out and they play it at the end. And I don't, to this day, have never seen a concert audience go, what the hell? Like, oh my God, like that, that was insane. Just like blew the roof off level, like intensity. Um, just, just nuts. Um, that's a, that's a, you asked, I remember hearing about that later. Kyle, you had a point you want to make real quick? Um, around the time for Unlawful Carnal Knowledge Out, Van Halen did put out a two CD music uh, a live right. album set from right. that concert tour. And they were in Miami because it was after the major hurricane that came through. Cause I re- you remember specifically um, the, c- the cover of that with the house destroyed, but the statue of Jesus Christ still standing. And I remember and I still have it. I, but the, in the album, Hammy, Sammy comes out and he goes, this is for you and starts playing jump. And you just hear even on that album, the screams and almost shock of the fans that, he started playing, they started playing jump. And so when you're telling that story, Shane, I'm, I'm going right to that album and just remembering hitting play. And he just, he hears Sammy go, this is for you. And it's to this day, still one of my favorite renditions of jump. Yeah. Uh, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, Murph. Can I tell a funny jump story real quick, please? You know, David Lee Roth and, uh, and Dave Grohl became friends and, da- and David Lee Roth used to come out and like, and do shows where, or, or do songs anyways, uh, with the Foo Fighters when they were on tour, especially in Los Angeles. And, uh, so there's a lot of reverence there. And, and if you know Taylor Hawkins at all, he's a massive Van Halen fan to the point to where he wears shorts when they play live that are, that are, uh, done up like Eddie's guitar and whatever. Anyway, so, uh, knowing that they are a huge fan. I saw the Foo Fighters a few years ago too. And one of the funniest things, if you've ever seen the Foo Fighters, they're almost like comedians at times. And uh, Dave goes on this, uh, he introduces their keyboard player and the keyboard player starts gently playing Imagine. Okay. And Dave goes, this is tough times right now, people. And you know, this is the times we all got to get together and we got to find points of unity and we got to find ways to really bring us together and really things that we can rally around and hold hands. And you know, this is one of those songs that just brings everybody together. And so if you know the words, I want you to sing it along with me as the keyboard player gently is playing the song. Imagine. And then Dave gets on the mic and he goes, I get up and nothing gets me down. You got it tough. <laughs> and goes on to sing, jump, Along to imagine the whole thing. He doesn't just like stop after a bar and go, ha ha. No, they played the whole thing. It was brilliant. It was one of the most amazing uh, Van Halen tributes ever. To, 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 to Is that on YouTube? I'm sh- it's got to be. It's okay, I got to look that up. That's, that was in Nashville, crazy. but that, uh, but I <laughs> bet you that was a shtick they were pulling at a bunch of different shows. So, yeah, if you just Google Foo Fighters Jump Imagine, I'll bet you you can find okay. a video of it. That's, that's awesome. So that good. is awesome. All right, we're going to do, we're going to take a quick little break here uh, for the Fandom Podcast Network promo. We're going to let you guys know what other great podcasts that we have here at the Fandom Podcast Thank you for listening. We hope you're enjoying this podcast. We like to continue to feed your ears by inviting you to listen to the Fandom Podcast Network and all of the other awesome shows we have to offer. It starts with our flagship show, Culture Clash, our weekly pop culture news podcast. Blood Kings, our Highlander podcast. Couch Potato Theater, our podcast celebrating our favorite movies. Time Warp. The Fandom Flashback Podcast, discussing a year in movies and our favorite pop culture topics. Enzo, the NFL Podcast. Good Evening, an Alfred Hitchcock Podcast. Union Federation, our Star Trek and Orville Podcast. Hair Metal, the 80s and early 90s Rock Metal Podcast. Type 40, our Doctor Who Podcast. Lethal Mullet, a 1980s and 90s action film podcast. What a Piece of Junk, a Star Wars podcast. And our newest show, Making Treks, a new Star Trek podcast with a deep dive into the final frontier with host Mark Newbold and Adam P. O'Brien. You can enjoy all of these great Fandom Podcast Network shows on our master feed at fpnet.podbean.com. Fandom Podcast Network is also on Apple Podcast, iTunes, <coughs> Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. You can also find us on Facebook under Fandom Podcast Network. You can also email us at fandompodcastnetwork at gmail.com. You can also find us on Instagram and Twitter under Fandom Podcast Network. Thank you for listening, and remember, respect others and enjoy your fandom.
All right, welcome back to Hair Metal. Oh, man, giving some tribute to Eddie Van Halen here. Um, we miss him. We miss him dearly. It hurts. Uh, I wanted to take an opportunity uh, to let some of our other friends on social media and some other fans uh, comment, whether it was in the, the Hair Metal podcast uh, fandom group or on my, uh, on my personal Facebook feed. Uh, my buddy uh, Carlos shared a great video from Austin West, who uh, is uh, uh, currently in the service right now of the United States, and he did a great little video. I can't tell if he did it uh, somewhere where he was stationed, but he was in uniform. So, Carlos, thank you for that. My buddy David Love over there in the UK said, great idea to remember Eddie Van Halen and his amazing talents. I think I first came across Van Halen through friends at high school in the early 80s. The first album sounded incredible, still does today. Nobody has ever made a sound like Van Halen did. They brought us the sound of Southern California all the way across the pond to us pasty Scottish kids. I still remember hearing Hot for Teacher at my pal Jamie's house on his dad's record player and his teacher's mom being horrified that we were listening to it. I think it was Jamie's. I think Jamie was crying that day too. Happy days, yeah. rest in peace, Edward Van Halen. You know, you know David Love, right, Murph? Scotland's David Love, absolutely. Yes. That's right. That's right. Uh, friend of the Fandom Podcast Network and director of now the uh, multi-award winning horror short, uh, The Killer of Grassy Ridge, and also uh, has been on the Hair Metal uh, podcast several times, Johnny K said, what I will say is my old band did our very best to cover Running With The Devil, Ain't Talking About Love, and You Really Got Me, and there was nothing more humbling to a young guitar player, he's speaking of himself, he is not only entertained, but he's inspired and pushed us all to be better. Musicians like Eddie come around every few centuries, and there won't be another for a very long time. Rest in peace. Uh, my buddy Sharif, who is a uh, big Raiders fan, uh, he's one of the super fans that dresses up uh, as Thanos, and he calls himself Black Thanos. Great guy. Met him in Oakland uh, last year at the last Raiders game, and uh, he put up a post. And his music knowledge is impressive. It covers all genres. I love this guy. He said, in a televised interview, Eddie Van Halen revealed that as a child, he attended a segregated school. And being that he was an immigrant who did not speak English very well, he was considered a minority. Thus, his first friends in America were black named Steve and Russell. And he also stated that the white kids who bullied him as a child, beating him up, making him eat sand, etc. However, it was with black kids who took, who took up for him and protected and defended him. As a child of his Indonesian mother and Dutch father, before he achieved the American dream of success and his talent, he, exper he experienced the, the age-old American reality of race-based intolerance. Through the universal language of music, Eddie helped change a nation in a world by conquering ignorance and creating common ground with the passion of his gift. Many years after his childhood, he would play lead guitar on the global smash hit Beat It by Michael Jackson, which I believe is the highest selling single in the iconic career of Michael Jackson. Eddie played it for free out of the admiration for Quincy Jones. I guess it was the wheel of karma coming full circle since his childhood. Rest in peace to a remarkable music force and inspiration. Shane, I wanted to ask you this. Uh, I didn't know about this till a few years later about him playing this riff. Uh, did you know that right away? Um, I've known that for a while. I, yeah, I, I, that, that story. The, basically, and the funny part about it is, is he talks, he's done interviews where he's talked about, he didn't ask for any money on it. And the amount, he could have asked for like a point and or a royalty and given the he said he could have made like tens of millions of dollars at this point just on that song alone yeah um you know given all that you know i, I want to point out one interesting thing about you know to say kind of based on that what you just read is you know it kind of his music is sort of generational it's kind of it's 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 brought a lot of other people together for as cl as cliche as that sounds but I can't remember a time in recent memory, given how divided our country is, that everybody stopped and said, whoa, yeah. let's just put a pause on everything for right now and say how much we love this dude. I mean, they were playing Panama or actually all of his songs during like all the breaks on one of the NFL games the other day. Um, like, I can't think of any anything like any artist or celebrity where everyone just stops doing whatever they're doing 
and saying, wow, we love this dude. He's been part of like our country forever and our just national identity. That's 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 an excellent point, Shane. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Murph, did you want to say something? Yeah, on the beat it thing, it's really interesting. So Eddie comes into the studio, and the and one of the reasons that he didn't want to have any any credit on that was because they had an agreement that they would do no solo projects back then. So he didn't want to. That's why he didn't want to take any money. He didn't want it because he didn't want it to to come off as that this was Eddie Van Halen being separate from Van Halen themselves. Uh, and so and it, but the other thing that's interesting about that story too is that he rearranged the song. Like right. that's how genius this guy was like, not like Michael Jackson's not a musical genius, but Oh yeah. By the way, Eddie Van Halen comes rolling up in the studio and goes, yeah, we should take this part, put it over here, take this, move it over here whatever. And they went, yeah, you're right. Okay. Thanks, Ed. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, just no, no <laughs> limit to the, to his genius. It was, I amazing. remember hearing that. He's in the video, What's that? He's in the video isn't he? Is that him? Or oh, it's not him playing yeah. in the I don't video. Believe so no, yeah. No, there's a- oh, I always thought it was. I knew that like when it was out. Like I've always known. It's one of those things I've always known. So I have I always I mean, I know Slash did it later with Dirty Diana. It was suddenly became the thing to do. But I always thought maybe Eddie was sort of up there and he was maybe he wasn't. Maybe I just always thought they, that they've done him, a number of, of live know. concert footage of the of Michael Jackson's That's, tour, the, yes. the, the victory tour, where he would yeah, come out and play in his like 1984 costume. Right, right. It, you know. Yeah. Kyle, did you have something you want to say? Well, well, let's not forget too that Eddie Van Halen did melt George McFly's brain. <laughs> this is true, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. One of my favorite scenes in, in Back to the Future. I actually tried to recreate that cassette tape because I thought it was so cool. I did that myself. Uh, Steve Hargrave, one of my friends in the 501st Star Wars costume group, he says, I wore out the first album, 8-Track. Love that, 8-Track, man. I was in 8th grade at the time, and it released and stood in line many times to buy the next album when they were released. Funny story. We would queue up the beginning of Running with the Devil and blast it on the school bus as we approached the railroad tracks. The bus driver was unamused. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Uh, our friend Christy Morris, a uh, friend of the network and close uh, friend of mine, um, she says, happy to chip in here. I remember the first Van Halen song I ever heard was Dance the Night Away. And from then was hooked. Eddie Van Halen was revolutionary in the guitar riffs he brought and always had the incredible energy and absolute rapture visible when he played. To hear he also got sober and lived with cancer made me respect him even more. I'll be playing Van Halen music on repeat even now more than ever. Rest in peace, Eddie. You will always make me smile and ready to rock out. Um, I heard it was his dad that got him onto all that stuff. Yes. Dad, he, he was very nervous. Yes, he, uh, he, dad, yes, he has talked about nervous. that. His dad his was dad drinking like, and, uh, yeah, I, he, yep. Yeah, have a drink and have a cigarette. Yeah. He's like, yeah, that works. Yeah. And then it I wanted to work. share a story that Johnny K brought to me. Uh, he's part because he's part of the film industry. He's part of this Facebook group called Film Crew, and uh, it's about all of these uh, guys that work behind the scenes on TV uh, movies, and they share stories and stuff like that. And when the death of Annie Van Halen happened, and and Aaron, you'll like this one because we're big Buffy the Vampire Slayer fans. You too, Kyle. Mm-hmm of the television series. And uh, this guy said, Buffy Van Halen, 1987, Santa Monica, California. In 1977, I began working on the second season of Buffy the Vampire Slayer TV series. It was a grind, but we... 2003, whoa, whoa, whoa. You you just said 1977. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, in, I'm sorry, 1997. Thank you. 1997, been working on, uh, sorry, Star Wars came out in 77 and it's still in my brain. So there we go. <laughs> uh, he said he'd been working on the second season in 97 and it was a grind, but we actually had fun working on this cult classic show. During the season, we shot on a library set practically every episode and Buffy fans know exactly what that is. After a while, just about every crew member poked through the set looking at the book titles. One day we were waiting for something. I leaned against a bookshelf and once again looked at random titles. We frequently used an LTM 6K par on a platform for a D-A-Y-I-N-T. This is all film jargon stuff. Uh, scenes. And this scene was day and at that H-A-M-H-M-I source came at a sharp angle on numerous bookshelves. 
I picked up a book like many times before and flipped through the pages. Halfway through this book was a postcard or a photo. It was a photo. A bit surreal, honestly, baffling. It was a six, four by six inch photograph. Not just any subject, not just any air, year, but a rare image. I've got to be honest, I may be one of the biggest Van Halen fans around. I know they are bigger because of their age. I'm a huge fan. I look at this photo and it's Eddie Van Halen taken in 1982. I get on the walkie talkie and tell the crew, Tommy is 10 1, which signals the crew I'm going to the bathroom. I take this photo and the head to our 48 inch electric truck and put it in my locker and then head back to the library set. All day long, I can't believe it. Another day on Buffy, but not. The day was dragging because all I could think about, it was really happening. Finally, they call rap, and I head back to my locker, take the tools, walkie-talkie, headset off. I'm rushing to see if that photo really exists. Well, it does. It happened, and today I share my photo of Eddie Van Halen to the world on this week of his passing in a simple rhyme. And he shows the picture of Eddie Van Halen in beat up jeans, a plaid shirt uh, with a kind of a a black Fender type guitar. And boy, does he look young. And I messaged this guy. I said, hey, man, this is great. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to use this thing. And he said, fine, Um, I'm going to put on the podcast. But I had to share that. I just thought that was really, really cool. Uh, And uh, I just I love stories like this. So let's get into some final thoughts and closing here, guys. Uh, Shane, first of all, it is really good to connect with you uh, face-to-face sort of in this world. I know we used to spend a lot more time together. I remember <laughs> I remember you were always the cool goth guy. Yeah. And uh, I remember – but I remember when we started sharing our love for hair metal because uh, I was throwing one of my annual Dragon Con Red Room parties and I put up this uh, prearranged music. I'd throw in a little gothy stuff and a little rock stuff. And I remember after a few drinks – Bon Jovi's Living on a Prayer came on and you were dancing on the bed singing that thing. I hope you don't mind me sharing that story. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's been great. You know, I, I, I think my, my kind of final thoughts is, and I'll bring something up about, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of talk about Eddie is, you know, his contributions to things and, and music and culture and, uh, you know, kind of the American, rock experience, maybe just in the world experience. But something that's interesting is a few years ago, he donated all of his guitars to Mr. Holland's opus, um, which they made a move out of, which was a basically a philanthropic organization that teaches uh, kids how to play music. So he clearly knew that his time was coming and he wanted to make sure that all of his guitars were actually put in the hands of people that would play them versus them just getting you know auctioned off or sold so he donated all of his like hundreds of guitars um to schools all throughout the los angeles area and uh that's you know to me that's eddie van halen besides all the music besides every great story i've heard in a million you know concerts and whatnot a very humble you know nice guy that you know that that did the right thing you know, as often as possible. And, uh, you know, when his, when he had his legacy, when it really came down to it, it was making sure and trying to help other people play guitar. Yeah. yeah. Uh, loss. Um, just one last thing. I, was it you that said something on social media where, uh, he was such a studio rat. And I remember seeing an interview right. with Kurt Loder going to his 5150 and he had guitars everywhere. And that he probably has recorded so much unreleased stuff that it'd be interesting yeah. to see what comes out. He probably has a he's he's got a vault that's comparable to Prince's. Yeah. Um, they basically just never stopped recording, and they just recorded song for song for song. It's not really known like in like what level of completion those songs are at. But he was such a kind of a you do it once and it's per- perfect. He didn't have to do stuff a whole lot of times. Um, if you read some of the interviews with Ted Templeman, he basically said, this is the one guy I ever produced that he would just go in and do stuff on one take. Um, and we have it. He'd do it live. Like we didn't have to mix stuff. You know, occasionally a little bit of um, uh, stuff. But he said, he's the only guy he ever, he ever produced that would just come in, play his part. It would be perfect every time. And that'd be the end of it. So we may get more Van Halen music. You know, from what I read today is that his, 
his son and his brother, Alex, um, are going to basically take over. You know, they're going to go in and figure, you know, figure that out and take over his check out like his estate his, and all that kind of stuff and see what they can his, do. His like guitar line. And, and so you never know. I mean, we may get, we may get more, more music out. I think the saddest thing that for me was I read today that, you know, they had planned a huge stadium tour um, for 2019 that, that just couldn't happen. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I remember listening to Eddie trunk and he's been, they, the Eddie, the Eddie camp's been so quiet about everything. There was no news coming out and um, they were curious, you know, obviously they knew that he was struggling with his health wise. So yeah. Um, Murph, I want to go to you, get some final thoughts on Eddie Van Halen. But. First off, I love that story that you told there and how he ended that with uh, in a simple rhyme, which is a amazing song off that women and children first album, which is still my my favorite uh, Van Halen album. The, to me, there's no misses. You know, there's um, regardless of what band it is. A lot of times there are there are albums that come out and, uh, and there are some misses on there. But that one start to finish is incredible. And I'm also a firm believer that you find you, you find the true essence of a band typically in their third album, whether it's, you know, Sabbath's Masters of Reality, the Black Crows did Amorica, Aerosmith's Toys in the Attic, Master of Puppets. Like we could go on and on and on. It's like that third album is where you find like I think where we're, we're, we're bands really come together and and, are, and truly like reveal their identity. Led Zeppelin three, and 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 that's what Women and Children First is, and it will always be uh, my favorite. And speaking of that, and this is something I I did forget to to uh, mention earlier when I did see Van Halen in twenty twelve. That was one of the things that I loved so much about seeing them is that they played Romeo Delight. Like that's like a song that you wouldn't think they would play in twenty twelve, but they played it and they did it well. And so th- we lost one of the last. Vir- the, uh, we lost a virtuoso. We lost one of the last great living guitarists. I think, you know, it's a very short list from here out. You know, you're talking about Jimmy Page, Slash, Kurt Hammett, maybe. You know, I mean, like it's a very short list from Angus Young. Clearly, um, very short list in terms of like the greatest living guitar players that that are left. And uh, and my hope is that the next crop. Uh, I mentioned Dirty Honey earlier, a good Los Angeles band, uh, Rival Sons, uh, Greta Van Fleet, where there's a lot of younger bands that were coming up before COVID hit. And my my hope is that the legacy of Eddie Van Halen resonates with those younger bands that resonates in terms of like the innovation. You know, um, we've talked about Jimi Hendrix tonight. Jimi Hendrix was the first one to me that took this instrument and decided to play it in a way that it wasn't meant to be played. He strung it upside down and he poked holes in his amplifier and did all those things. Eddie took that to the next, next, next level. The innovation. He was an inventor, absolutely. man. <laughs> when you look at the Frankenstrat, yeah. when you look at what he did, there wasn't a lot of money invested in this. This wasn't some millionaire taking like the best of the best of the best to assembling it. He was taking what he had available. He was hot rodding his guitars and came up with this amazing sound, this amazing tone, this amazing feel. I believe it was Aaron earlier or someone that mentioned like you reckon, you know, Eddie Van Halen from a note or two. It doesn't take much because it was so distinct. And my hope is that that legacy builds in the younger and the next crop of guitar players coming up because, you know, frankly, I love all this stuff and I love that we can connect with all this but I'm ready for the next thing. It's been an awful long time since we've had an Eddie Van Halen. It's been an awful long time since we had a rock and roll band like, like them, you know what I mean? And, and I know there are some good ones and I know like Jack- the Foo Fighters are probably one of the biggest yeah. ones right now that we can relate really, you to, know, you and, know, and Jack and, White, yeah. like he does some brilliant stuff like there's, but even those guys are, you know, they're our age. The struts. Yeah. yeah the struts our too, age, yeah. man. Like where's the neck. And so anyways, I hope the legacy of Eddie Van Halen is that, that you don't have to be rich. You don't have to have a bunch of computers. You don't, you have to be talented and you have to work hard and you got to go out there and you got to bust your ass and hone your craft. And I hope that that's what the, that's what the, what the legacy ultimately that forms and man, he's missed. I'm just going to end at that, that he's missed. And it's sad, but it's, you know, if it's just an excuse for you to go out there and, 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 and refamiliarize yourself with the entirety of their catalog, then do that, then do that because that music will live on forever. Well said, Aaron, final thoughts, Eddie Van Halen. Well, I mean, as I said, it does, it's a, it's a part of my teen, early 20 years of, you know, listening to Van Halen from basically probably 1984 was when I first met it. it was, 
you know, their videos were one of the they one of the first to do the video Thank you. for Hot for Teacher. It wasn't just a live video. Earlier on, it was live videos, but then they decided they took the MTV and they had the you know the spe- and that's what you watch. That's what dragged you in is because they were fun. They had the kids, you know. It was all this really great sort of doing the film. For MTV, so that's how I first saw them, and then of course you know getting older, we then jumped into the Hagar years, and I mean, I mean we didn't really touch on it, but there was always the rivalry, and there was a, a funny meme going around. You know, there's the women's toilets and the men's toilets, and at the top it had Van Halen for the men's toilets and Van Hagar for the women's, which I have to say is probably true because they did do the whole love, lots of love, everything was love. But it was a bigger sound. It was a bigger, it was a different sound, totally different. That's what I loved. It wasn't just when Hager came in, they were going to go, well, well, you're just going to be David Lee Roth. They created a whole new sound. It was bigger. It was more produced. Some people like that. I know friends of mine hate it. That's fine. We're all going to bring together and we're going to love everything because that's all we've got now. You know, that rivalry is going because you're just going to grab whatever you can. But I remember, I mean, I'm, look, I'm not the musician, but at that time it was like Eddie Van Halen and Steve Vai made their sound guitars talk. They talk. Uh. You know, Steve Vai has the what I call the neighing horse. You know, meh, he does, he neighs his, his guitar. Eddie's talked. It talked. You know, and so did, so they had not just playing it. It wasn't just playing. It was creating its own personality, which I'm sorry to say you're not going to get again. You really aren't unless some kids, while sitting here in isolation, go back and get off their crap and get out their, you know, dad's albums and listen to it and start going, we need to bring this back. Because occasionally you get, you know, you get your comedy groups like Steel Panther or whatever they were. Uh, what's the band that does sort of the hair metal, but it is a comedy group? Steel you know, Panther, yeah. Yeah, Steel yeah. Panther. They do it, but it's a parody in a sense. But, yeah, I mean, look, you know, all I can think of when I put on Van Halen, it's like putting on your favourite pair of worn jeans your favourite T-shirt, you're in your old manual car, you've got your tape deck that you've mixed your tapes and it is the sun and it is the surf and it is just a great time of all you had is time. And a little part of, as I said, the music died and I'm going to stop because I'm going to cry. So there you go. I'm leaving it at that. Well said. Uh, It's funny you reminded me of when I – learned how you could use a volume knob and tap a note and get a really cool sound because I'm like, what is he doing with this volume? What? What? Who does that? Anyway, Kyle, final thoughts, Eddie Van Halen. You know, greatness is a word anymore that gets thrown out a lot. And we, we throw it on a lot of things, but to be great, you have to be unique. You, you have, you can't just be part of the crowd. You, Eddie Van Halen, there's there's never going to be another Eddie Van Halen, period. That's, that's just, the music is changing. I think the ideas involved with music is changing. And I don't know if there are people in the world anymore that can tap into that kind of creativity that Eddie Van Halen had and saw the world through the eyes of, and some music through the eyes of Eddie Van Halen did. The man couldn't read music. He didn't want to read music. He just felt the music. He lived it. And, you know, I look through my lifetime, and you want to talk about greatness. Um, you know, you can talk athletes. You can talk Michael Jordan. You can talk Olympic heroes. You can talk great people, people who've done amazing things. But sometimes that just inside greatness it comes out in in people you don't expect or, or places you don't expect it to come from. It came from Eddie Van Halen. Because you talk about all the other great guitarists of this time, whether it's Steve I, Slash, whatever. Eddie Van Halen was just on a different plane was the minute he started playing his guitar. And I, I, to me, the only person that even comes close to that is Jimi Hendrix. And that's a different time. 
Eddie Van Halen just went to another world, another place. Every time, the minute he picked it up and he took every, we were fortunate enough. He decided to let us along on the ride. And as much as we see it, when we listen to the music, what I wouldn't give to have five minutes to see it through Eddie's eyes as he's playing and see what that, what that world look, look like to him. And we talk about, we, we talked about it and I just don't know if we're going to have if music's ever going to be that again, we have, don't get me wrong. We have great musicians. We have some that are still iconic. I think Dave Grohl is one of going to go down in history as one of the greatest musicians of all, all time. But Dave Grohl, Dave Grohl is a totally different thing. Eddie Van Halen is associated with the guitar. And I don't, I can't think of anybody who's associated with an instrument like Eddie Van Halen is currently the only name that even remotely comes to mind of somebody being associated with an instrument like Eddie Van Halen with, with the guitar right now is Lindsey Sterling with the violin. And because when you listen to her music, it's the same thing. You just wonder what that world is that she's seeing when she's playing. And I hope that there's a generation now that is seeing all this love for Eddie Van Halen and seeing the impact Eddie Van Halen had, and they're going out. They're like Aaron said, going through their father's records or downloading on digital, whatever, listening to this music and getting inspired. And maybe that's the final gift from Eddie Van Halen is that in his death, he inspires somebody not to be the next Eddie Van Halen, but to be the next great thing of greatness. And that's, that's what I hope comes out of it. I want to say thank you, first of all, for coming on your first hair metal. I'm not going to say you hit for the cycle, but you definitely, uh, I would say you called your shot and you hit a home run then. Well done. Thank you, sir. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Shane, thank you so much for coming on and thank you for coming on such short notice as well, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, Kevin. You know, one kind of quick follow-up, follow-up is, you know, I saw Eddie Trunk said something on Twitter yesterday that I, I, I hope happens is, you know, if there's any artist in the history of rock after Freddie Mercury that deserves his like Freddie Mercury style tribute concert, I, I hope all the other members of Van Halen can get together at some point after all this insanity is over and, and do a huge show in L.A. where we get, you know, an entire generation of guitarists that come up and play. Uh, I think that would be the perfect end cap to to this whole story. But uh so thanks for having me on. It's been great. Love to talk Van Halen or rock with you anytime. That's awesome, man. You just reminded me I went to uh, a Les Paul tribute uh, at Universal Amphitheater and uh, he couldn't make the trip because he was sick and it was about maybe a, a year or so before he passed away. Uh, but uh, I would love to see something like that for Eddie Van Halen. You, you nailed it. Murph, uh, thank you for that tweet. Um, or, or that, that text that you sent me, man, um, you, you put a foot in my butt to do this and I appreciate you. Thank you for hey, coming man, on. Thank you for having me, man. This has been awesome. And, and, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of everything that you guys do on the network and I'm always, you know, honored to, to, to join you any, anytime you ask to have me be a part of it. And, you know, when I saw that he had passed away, like that was one of my first thoughts was like, let's get together and, <laughs> and celebrate this man's life and, and his body of work. And you know, what better place to do it than here on the, on, on the hair metal podcast. So, so thank you for having me in here, man. And, and uh, yeah, like Shane and, and, and the rest of everybody on the panel, man, like anytime, like let's, let's, let's do it. Cause you know, I, uh, gosh, man, we just, we lost a great one. It's a little disheartening, you know, that it's a little disheartening yeah. to hear, you know, that like we may not see this again, but, um, but I don't know, my, my, my hope's going to ride high that, uh, that maybe we will have the good fortune to, uh, you know, talk some high level rock and roll, man, in the, in the future and not about the past. I'm going to get a little personal here. Uh, 2020 sucks for many reasons. Um, Aaron, you and I were supposed to get married in April in your hometown in Melbourne, Australia. It didn't happen. I couldn't get over there. Uh, and one of the things I loved about planning that trip was uh, not just our wedding itself, but uh, things like you mentioned earlier, our music playlist and how it was growing and growing for our wedding list. And uh, there were several, several Van Halen songs on there. And I remember making you an actual mixtape and I burned it on CD. I put it on USB drive as a present and I put some Van Halen songs on there. First of all, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate that. And uh, it's uh, not a matter. It's not a question of if. It's just when we're going to get married. And we're going to ride through this. And I can't 
freaking wait till that happens. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, no, thank you for letting me on. I know it was a bit of a, a heavy drama happening around here, but I'm so glad I came on. And as much as I'm probably, you know, I am the female view, and um, but it, it is a time of of us growing up and, you know, every time I listen to their music, it's a, it's a blankie. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nice blankie bat and buffy for me. But anyway, you know, and, and it, and listening to, you know, when it's love, you know, and it, and it brings back great memories. But I, I mean, I also think that as much as he died at 65, what a life. What Lord, what did he achieve? He wasn't someone who could live to a hundred and did nothing, you know. He lived twenty thousand lives, and it's it's um, it is sad, but his family was with him. I mean, I thought that was beautiful, you know. As you said, his his wife that you know, even though they're not together, they were there, and you know, it just shows you how much love. And and what's such a special person that even though we never knew him, he was part of our lives. And um, it is sad, but it is also wonderful to look back and reconnect with old friends that you grew up with listening to, you know, that he brought us together. And I'm going to be the emotional one and I'm going to stop crying. So thank you again, guys. It's been a pleasure. I'm going to listen to all the, oh, you ain't one too. <laughs> <laughs> And um, thanks again. Love you, Kevin. We will. We'll Thank get you. married and all those songs will be played. It's the it's hair middle happen. wedding. It's going to happen. Oh, God. Well, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Shane. Thank you, Murph. I'm Kevin. And join us again next time here on the Fandom Podcast Network for another episode of the Hair Metal Podcast where we will tease our hair with Aquanet. Slip on those tight ripped jeans, leather pants, or lip service attire and rock out in that leather motorcycle jacket. Remember, every rose has its thorn, and on a steel horse, we will ride. Hair metal lives. Eddie Van Halen, you will live in our hearts and our memories until we are gone. Thank you so much, Eddie. Rock on, everyone, and goodbye. Goodbye.